Mark 14, 12 to 16. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, the disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and the man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Hello, Inglewood. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Benjamin Park, and I'm grateful to be here with you today, and especially grateful to be joining you for this really interesting and intriguing sermon series on Holy Week. I've never looked at Holy Week like this before, so I'm excited to be a part of this with you. This week, we're going to be looking at Maundy Thursday together. So where does the name Maundy Thursday come from? Uh, it comes from the Latin word for commandment, and it references the command that Jesus gives to his disciples after he washes their feet uh, on the night before uh, Good Friday, on the day before Good Friday. And that command is this, John 13, 34, love one another as I have loved you. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, Maundy Thursday wasn't a big thing. In fact, I didn't even really know about it growing up as a Christian uh, until I went to seminary. Uh, you know, we knew Good Friday. Uh, we usually did something for that. Of course, Easter was probably the biggest service of the year for us. But Maundy Thursday, it kind of got the short end of the stick. But, and I'm not just saying this because this is my week, I would argue that when we take the time to stop and reflect on what Jesus does and says on Maundy Thursday, what we find is that actually it's nothing less than the foundation and the lens through which we understand what Jesus does and says on Good Friday and Easter. Let's flesh that out a bit. So we know that Jesus does and says a lot of things in the Gospels. So what makes this commandment uh, to love others as he has loved us any different? When I was growing up, I uh, remember one day going to school and a friend of mine uh, was wearing a bracelet. And on that bracelet, there were four letters, WWJD. And I was like, well, what's that all about? And he explained it to me. And as soon as, after he, after he explained it to me, suddenly I noticed all these other kids at school who had the same bracelet. It seemed like overnight, everyone had gotten this WWJD bracelet. Now, if you had somehow missed this fad, uh, what WWJD stood for and stands for is what would Jesus do? Now, I don't know who came up with this. I don't know where it all started. But what I do know is that one day I came to school and I saw those bracelets everywhere. It seemed like everyone had them. Now, as great of a thing as it is to reflect on what Jesus did and what Jesus might do in our day and age, there were some problems with those bracelets. And one of those problems is Jesus did a lot of things. So how do you answer that question? What would Jesus do? One person might say this, another person might say that. One part of the Bible, Jesus is healing people and teaching. In another part of the Bible, he's tossing tables at the temple. How do we know which, which of these things to focus on? How do we know which commandment to prioritize, which teaching is the most important? There's a lot there. But the fact is, the answer is right in front of us. Of all the things that Jesus says and does, the command that Jesus gives on Monday, Thursday, to love one another as he has loved us, it's the hinge on which the rest of his ministry turns. And the rest of scripture supports this. First of all, this is what he chooses to focus on the night of his arrest, his last supper with his disciples. This is what he chooses to command them. 
And remember earlier in his ministry, Jesus is actually approached by a scribe who asks this question, what commandment is the most important of all? He puts it right there and Jesus answers him directly. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he quickly connects it to, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then later in 1 John, the apostle fleshes this out more, saying, we love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is why Jesus came to us. This is what his whole ministry has been about. He came to guide us into a life marked by love for one another. Now, some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, didn't Jesus come to give us eternal life? Isn't what his whole ministry was about? And I would say, yes, definitely. He absolutely came to do that. But let's think about what eternal life is. Is it simply just life extended for eternity? Or is it also life that is fit for eternity? A life that wouldn't be torture if it was extended, but would actually fill eternity. A life that goes beyond what our imaginations can fully grasp in our finite minds right now. Jesus came to show us the key to that kind of life. And it's right here in his commandment. The key is to love others as he has loved us. So Monday, Thursday, it's not just an afterthought in Holy Week. It's not just maybe a prelude to Good Friday and Easter. It's the foundation for those days. So with this in mind, let's look once again at the passage and consider what it reveals to us about Jesus's commandment, this foundational commandment to love one another as he has loved us. And I'm going to give you the framework here of how we're going to look at this. First, we're going to look at the context of the passage. And then second, we're going to look and see how this passage reveals two of the most deadly traps that catch us and sabotage our efforts to love one another. And then finally, we're going to dream together. So first, the context. In Mark's account, after years of ministry, Jesus has finally arrived in Jerusalem. And he's come with much fanfare. He has not kept a low profile. He is teaching publicly. Uh, and then when night falls, they, the disciples leave the city and actually stay outside the city, basically camping, sleeping out under the stars. And this is not a problem usually. I mean, this is how most of the time they've spent with Jesus has gone, except they are approaching the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which begins with the Passover. And here's why this is a problem. This feast, this Passover, it took a lot of preparation. Uh, one of the things they had to do uh, in order to celebrate the Passover is they would have had to go through the entire house where they're going to celebrate the Passover, sweep it completely clean of any leaven, any yeast, and get rid of absolutely all of it. This would have taken quite a long time to prepare. And anything that they found, they would have then had to go and burn. And this is among other preparations that they would have had to make. In other words, you couldn't just say, hey, it's the Passover today. Uh, what do we need? Let's let's go get some lamb. Let's call over a few friends and let's celebrate it. No, this is, this is something that would have taken days, if not weeks, to prepare for. But what happens with the disciples? They're totally unprepared for it. Let's look at Mark 14, 12. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? I mean, at this point, why are you even asking Jesus? It's too late. What are they gonna do? They can't prepare for it now. It's, what are they gonna do? And I think 
this is actually pretty much in character for the disciples. I mean, even just looking at Holy Week, despite spending years with Jesus and being mentored by him, in this final week together, it almost seems like every time they face any sort of obstacle, they stumble and they fall. Not just here with their lack of preparation, but then later as Peter denies Jesus. That night when Jesus calls them to keep watch with him and stay awake, they all fall asleep and fail him there. And then when Jesus is arrested, they all flee and scramble except for Peter. But, and I hope this is what you take away from this passage, consider how Jesus responds to his disciples' uh, suggestion that they go and prepare, or their question that they go and prepare for the Passover. Even in the midst of their lack of preparation, Jesus doesn't miss a beat. He says, and I'm paraphrasing, go into the city, there you will find a man who will lead you to a house, and the house will be open to us. In other words, we see the disciples stumble, but Jesus doesn't say, just stop, stay out of the way, I'll figure it out. No, instead he brings them closer to himself. He lays out his plan to them, and then he sends them. Instead of pushing them away so that he can solve the problem by himself, he appoints them, the very people that have stumbled and not been prepared, he sends them to be his ambassadors. He appoints them. I'm fortunate enough that in my city, uh, there is a small public ski area that specializes in introducing kids and families to skiing. And this is critical in Minnesota because in order to survive our long winters, um, you need to have some kind of a winter hobby, um, otherwise it's just unbearable. So wanting to give my son a bright future here, I, I signed him up for his first skiing class and we arrived and came to this class uh, full of kids who many of whom had never been on skis before. Now what do you think the teacher's attitude was as he saw this group of really, really new, uh, unexperienced, inexperienced skiers? Do you think he was worried about the mistakes that they were going to make? Do you think that he was waiting with dread for them to fall? No. He was totally prepared for it. And in fact, his entire lesson was planned around kids who had never been on skis before, kids who would fall, kids who wouldn't be able to follow his instructions well the first time. And wouldn't you know it, that as these kids uh, were welcomed by this teacher, uh, by a teacher who was ready for their stumbles and their falls. By the end of the first day, they had all made it down the hill. And by the end of the series of lessons, I could barely pry my son away from the ski slopes. When we think about what it would look like for us to love one another as Jesus has loved us, as we attempt to obey this, this key core command that Jesus gives us, I think one of the traps we run into is we disqualify ourselves from being able to do it. And we disqualify ourselves because we think that Jesus expects perfection from us. Maybe in our heads we know that he doesn't, we know that he forgives and that he has welcomed us as we are, but in practice, as we, as we actually try to obey that command, we think, it's too hard. I can't do it. I can't do it the way I want to do it. I can't obey in the way that I think Jesus wants me to obey. And so I'm just going to step back. I'm not even really going to try. I'm not really going to put myself out there. But what's Jesus's attitude towards us? We see it in how he sends his disciples even after their stumble. When he sees us, he sees all of us. He's not surprised by our failures. He's not surprised by the ways that we stumble and fall as we try to follow him. In fact, 
He's expecting it as he calls us to love others as he has loved us. Him saying love as he has loved us doesn't mean to do it perfectly as he has done. He means just put ourselves out there. Just try. That's what we're aiming for. That's the direction we're going in, but he doesn't expect us to be perfect. We disqualify ourselves, but instead, what Jesus is calling us to do is to not limit his potential to do something incredible and world-changing through us as we just attempt to be faithful, as we just attempt in our human and broken way to love others as he has loved us. So that's the first trap, self-disqualification. The second trap that we see here is one that I like to call the trap of over-spiritualization. Let's take a look again at the passage. So Jesus sends his disciples into the city even after they have shown how unprepared they are. But notice the exact instructions that he gives them. We paraphrased this before, but now let's actually look at the verse. Verse 13. And he sent two of his disciples and he said to them, Go into the city. And a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. So my wife and I, when we are on Netflix looking for something to watch, we usually don't have too much trouble finding something that we both like but she definitely tends towards the rom-coms and the reality shows, and I definitely tend more towards the action movies, the, the Marvel movies. And one type of movie I'm always on the lookout for is a really well done spy movie. I like spy movies. And so it immediately caught my eye as I heard these instructions from Jesus because it seemed like something totally out of a spy movie. Jesus sends his disciples into the city. He gives them specific instructions to look for a, a man with a distinctive feature and that this man would lead them to where their objective was. Totally like a spy movie. But why go through all this? Why order them to follow this man instead of just going to the house that he knows that he wants them to celebrate the Passover in? Well, one effect of telling the disciples to look for this man is that it brings their attention and ours to who this man is. Why is he carrying this jar of water? Who is he? And as we ask that question, we see something pretty dark about this entire situation. First of all, this man was likely a slave. The job of carrying water was a menial task. It was uh, something that just had to be done in order for daily life to be lived. And so this man uh, with this menial job, he was likely a slave. And that meant that the house that Jesus was sending his disciples to get ready for uh, them to celebrate the Passover in was the home of a slave owner. They were going to celebrate the freeing of the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt in the home of a slave owner, in a home where one human had the power over another human to order him to daily fetch his water for him. I don't think this is an accident. I don't think Jesus puts a spotlight on this man by accident. He does this because he wants to couch his command, this, this key core command to love one another as he has loved us directly in the reality of what it meant to live in Jerusalem, of what it meant to live in first century Israel. With all of its brokenness, with all of its mess, with all of the ways that humans did the opposite of loving one another. It was into that reality Jesus made his command and showed his disciples 
that the way of life that he wanted them to lead was a life marked by loving one another as he has loved us. Here's what this passage shows us. This is the trap that this passage reveals to us. It's the trap of over-spiritualizing Jesus' love and by extension, his command to love one another. Over-spiritualizing is something, it's a trap that has ensnared the church over and over. Time and time again, the church has found it easier to distance itself from the world and try to focus on obeying Jesus in its own bubble. Even today, many followers of Christ are tempted to gloss over the deep brokenness and destruction in our world and instead just focus on our personal relationship with him or just focus on the life to come. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, our relationship with Jesus, walking with him personally, uh, it is a precious, precious thing. It's a precious gift that he gives to us. But he wants to walk with us in the here and now. He wants to walk with us in the reality of our world, not somehow detach from us. Or to put it this way, Jesus wants to be with us. He wants to be in the midst of those times when someone is unexpectedly taken away from us. He wants to be the one who doesn't turn away from things like slavery and hunger and the stripping of human dignity, but instead looks at all of it and proclaims, my love, witnessed to and demonstrated by these broken followers of mine, has the power to bring true, deep healing and transformation. So let us not fall into the trap of over-spiritualization. Let us not over-spiritualize Jesus' command to love one another. Instead, let us dream big. Let us consider how something so simple as loving others as Jesus has loved us is exactly the catalyst that God wants to use to heal this world that he loves so much. And as we do that, let us present ourselves to God. Let us say to him, I might not know exactly what this is going to look like, but I want to love others as you have loved me. And as we dream together about what this could look like, let us not forget that the one who gave us this command could not be kept in the grave, but now sits at the right hand of the Father, advocating for us, leading us, calling us forward.